In this series of short videos, we will be addressing historical events that have impacted this nation throughout its history. We hope that these presentations enhance your appreciation of history and those that lived it. When we study history, we tend to think of historical events such as a war as isolated events occurring in time. Studies in history typically move from one event to another without addressing the underlying causes or outcomes, both intended and unintended. We also need to realize that historical events are often multifaceted and are part of a continuum where the beginning and the end may be linked to other events. In this video, we will be looking at what came to be known as the Cold War. Well, we cannot hope to cover all the details involved in a conflict that covered almost half a century, what we show here should serve as a foundation for further research and study. This segment of our program was designed to support high school classroom instruction dealing with American History Content Statement Number 26, which deals specifically with the end of the Cold War. Additionally, however, there are a number of other content statements in both American and World History Studies that can also be touched upon as this topic is discussed. Before we can address the end of the Cold War, which is the primary focus of this video, we should probably set the stage by defining what the Cold War was and why it came to be. The Cold War could be defined as the open yet restricted rivalry that developed after World War II between the United States and the Soviet Union and their respective allies. The Cold War was waged primarily on political, economic, and propaganda fronts, which made it different from any other war in history. It was understood by both sides that direct military conflict between two nuclear-capable superpowers could quickly expand beyond their control with catastrophic consequences. Historians do not fully agree on the dates, but the period is generally considered to span the 1947 Truman Doctrine to the 1991 dissolution of the Soviet Union. The origins of the conflict, however, start building almost a decade earlier. Although not officially recognized until May 14, 1955, the foundation of what was later become known as the Warsaw Pact occurred early in World War II. In 1939, the USSR entered into an agreement with Nazi Germany that contained a secret protocol that divided Romania, Poland, Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, and Finland into German and Soviet spheres of influence. Eastern Poland, Latvia, Estonia, Finland, and Bessarabia in northern Romania were recognized as parts of the Soviet sphere of influence. Lithuania was added in a second secret protocol in September of 1939. The origins of what would become the Cold War were set primarily during two conferences held toward the end of World War II between the leaders of Great Britain, the Soviet Union, and the United States. The focus of the discussion at these two meetings was to shape post-war peace, but as events show, they also served to challenge world peace for another 46 years. The Yalta Conference was held in Crimea from February 4th to February 14th of 1945 to discuss the post-war reorganization of Germany and Europe and the defeat of Japan. By the time of the Yalta Conference, there was no longer a question regarding German defeat. Each of the three leaders had his own agenda for the meeting. American President Franklin Roosevelt wanted Soviet support in the Pacific War specifically for the planned invasion of Japan. British Prime Minister Winston Churchill pressed for free elections and democratic governments in Eastern and Central Europe while Soviet Premier Joseph Stalin demanded a Soviet sphere of political influence in Eastern and Central Europe as an essential aspect of the USSR's national security strategy. One of the major results of this meeting 
was that all three leaders ratified an agreement setting the boundaries of post-war occupation zones for Germany. There would be three zones of occupation, one for each of the three principal allies. They also later agreed to give France a zone of occupation, but Stalin required that it be carved out of the U.S. and British zones. Stalin agreed to enter the fight against the Empire of Japan two or three months after Germany surrendered and the war in Europe was terminated. In making this agreement, however, the Soviet Union would receive a number of concessions in the Far East. The second meeting was held at Potsdam, Germany from July 17th to August 2nd, 1945. Participants at this meeting were Stalin, Clement Attlee, who replaced Churchill as British Prime Minister, and President Harry S. Truman, representing the United States after President Roosevelt's death. The conference resulted in the Potsdam Declaration regarding the surrender of Japan and the Potsdam Agreement regarding the Soviet annexation of former Polish territories. A number of changes had taken place in the five months since the Yalta Conference that greatly affected the relationship among the leaders. The Soviet Union had occupied Central and Eastern Europe and the Red Army effectively controlled the Baltic states, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Bulgaria, and Romania. Stalin had set up a puppet communist government in Poland, insisted that his control of Eastern Europe was a defensive measure against possible future attacks, and claimed that it was a legitimate sphere of Soviet influence. The Western Allies had left Eastern Germany and the city of Berlin to be occupied by the Red Army. The Yalta Conference, held in February of 1945, had already determined that Germany and Berlin would be divided into four zones of occupation. The Soviets would occupy the eastern half of Germany and the eastern section of the city of Berlin. British, French, and American forces would occupy the western section of the country and the western sector of Berlin. In 1949, the Federal Republic of Germany was created out of the western zones. The Soviet zone became the German Democratic Republic. In addition at the Yalta Conference, the Allies agreed that an undefined post-war Korea would be placed under four-power multinational trusteeship. After Japan's surrender, this agreement was modified to a joint Soviet-American occupation of Korea. The agreement was that Korea would be divided and occupied by Soviets from the north and Americans from the south. Korea, formerly under Japanese rule, and which had been partially occupied by the Red Army following the Soviet Union's entry into the war against Japan, was divided at the 38th parallel. That military line became a political line in 1948, when the separate republics emerged on both sides of the 38th parallel, each republic claiming to be the legitimate government of Korea. This culminated in the North invading the South, starting the Korean War two years later. Truman had mentioned an unspecified powerful new weapon to Stalin during the conference. Stalin, however, had full knowledge of the atomic bomb's development from Soviet spy networks inside the Manhattan Project. The bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in August of 1945 prompted Stalin to order the development of Soviet nuclear weapons and on August 29, 1949, the Soviet Union conducted its first nuclear test. The nuclear arms race had begun. Following the surrender of Nazi Germany in May of 1945, the uneasy wartime alliance between the United States and Great Britain on one hand and the Soviet Union on the other began to unravel. The Soviets were determined to maintain control of Eastern Europe and they were intent on spreading communism worldwide. By 1948, the Soviet Union had annexed several occupied countries and converted them into Soviet-controlled satellite states. These included the People's Republic of Poland, the People's Republic of Hungary, the Czechoslovak Socialist Republic, the People's Republic of Romania, the People's Republic of Bulgaria, the People's Republic of Albania, and later the German Democratic Republic, 
formed from the Soviet zone of German occupation. The Cold War reached its first peak during the period between 1948 and 1953. In this period, the Soviets unsuccessfully blockaded the Western-controlled sectors of West Berlin in 1948 and 1949, resulting in the Berlin Airlift. In 1949, the United States and its European allies formed the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, or NATO, a unified military command to resist the Soviet presence in Europe. The Soviets exploded their first atomic warhead in 1949, thus ending the American monopoly on the atomic bomb. The Chinese Communists also came to power in mainland China in 1949, giving the Soviet Union a powerful ally. Finally, the Soviet-supported Communist government of North Korea invaded the U.S.-supported South Korea in 1950, setting off an indecisive Korean War that lasted until 1953. From 1953 to 1957, Cold War tensions relaxed somewhat, largely owing to the death of longtime Soviet dictator Joseph Stalin in 1953. Nevertheless, the standoff remained. On May 14, 1955, under the direction of Soviet Premier Nikolai Bulganin, the Warsaw Pact was formed as a mutual defense organization composed originally of the Soviet Union, Albania, Bulgaria, Czechoslovakia, East Germany, Hungary, Poland, and Romania. The treaty also allowed for the maintenance of Soviet military units on the territories of the other participating states. The Warsaw Pact was, however, the first step in a more systematic plan to strengthen the Soviet hold over its satellites. It quickly became apparent that Europe would remain a standoff without potentially catastrophic results. So the Soviets started looking at the Third World rather than Europe as an arena in which it could win the Cold War. Moscow would, in later years, fuel arms buildups in Africa. African countries, used as proxies in the Cold War, would often become failed states of their own. When Nikita Khrushchev took power in the Soviet Union in 1958, it ushered in another intense stage of the Cold War. The United States and the Soviet Union began developing intercontinental ballistic missiles, and in 1962, the Soviets began secretly installing missiles in Cuba that could be used to launch nuclear attacks on U.S. cities. This sparked the Cuban Missile Crisis a confrontation that brought the two superpowers to the brink of war before an agreement was reached to withdraw the missiles. The Cuban Missile Crisis showed that neither the United States nor the Soviet Union were ready to use nuclear weapons for fear of the other's retaliation. The two superpowers soon signed the Nuclear Test Ban Treaty in 1963, which banned above-ground nuclear weapons testing but the crisis also hardened the Soviets' determination never again to be humiliated by their military inferiority, and they began a buildup of conventional military forces, particularly in Eastern Europe. Throughout the Cold War, the United States and the Soviet Union avoided direct military confrontation in Europe and engaged in actual combat operations only to keep allies from defecting to the other side or to overthrow them after they had done so. The Warsaw Pact, particularly its provision for the garrisoning of Soviet troops in satellite territories, became a target of nationalist hostility in Poland and Hungary during the uprisings in those two countries in 1956. The Soviets also sent troops to preserve communist rule in East Germany in 1953, Czechoslovakia in 1968, and Afghanistan in 1979. For its part, the United States helped overthrow a left-wing government in Guatemala in 1954, supported the unsuccessful invasion of Cuba in 1961, invaded the Dominican Republic in 1965, and Grenada in 1983, and undertook a long and unsuccessful effort to prevent communist North Vietnam from bringing South Vietnam under its rule during the period 1964 to 1975. 
In the course of the 1960s and 1970s, however, the struggle between the Soviet and American blocs gave way to a more complicated pattern of international relationships in which the world was no longer split into two clearly opposing blocs. A major split had occurred between the Soviet Union and China in 1960 and widened over the years, shattering the unity of the communist bloc. In the meantime, Western Europe and Japan realized significant economic growth in the 1950s and 1960s, reducing their dependency on the United States. Less powerful countries now had more room to assert their independence and often showed themselves resistant to superpower coercion. The 1970s saw an easing of Cold War tensions primarily through agreements in 1972 and in 1979 in which the two superpowers sent limits on their anti-ballistic missiles and on their strategic missiles capable of carrying nuclear weapons. That, however, was followed by a period of renewed Cold War tensions in the early 1980s, as the two superpowers continued their massive arms buildup and competed for influence in the Third World. It was at this point the empire that was the Soviet Union began to show weaknesses. During the short period that Yuri Andropov served as general secretary, the pace of decline increased. Andropov faced a series of foreign policy crises. The hopeless situation of the Soviet army in Afghanistan, threatened revolt in Poland, growing animosity with China, the threat of war in the Middle East, and troubles in Ethiopia and South Africa. The most critical threat was the Second Cold War launched by American President Ronald Reagan and a specific attack on rolling back what he denounced as the evil empire. Reagan was using American economic power and Soviet economic weakness to escalate massive spending on the Cold War, emphasizing high technology that Moscow lacked. The main response by the Soviets was raising military spending to 70% of the national budget and supplying billions of dollars worth of military aid to Syria, Iraq, Libya, South Yemen, Cuba, and North Korea. In addition to the failing economy, the prolonged war in Afghanistan, often referred to as the Soviet Union's Vietnam War, led to increased public dissatisfaction with the communist regime. After the deaths of three successive elderly Soviet leaders, Leonid Brezhnev in November of 1982, Yuri Andropov in February of 1984, and Konstantin Cherenkov in March of 1985, the Soviet Politburo were forced to look to younger men to run the nation. In March of 1985, the Politburo elected Mikhail Gorbachev as Communist Party General Secretary. Gorbachev was a relatively young, reform-oriented leader with more focus on scientific or technical knowledge than his predecessors. More importantly, he was of a generation who had begun their careers during the period of de-Stalinization or the rejection of hardline communist philosophy. When Gorbachev assumed the reins of power in the Soviet Union, no one predicted the revolution he would bring. A dedicated reformer, Gorbachev introduced the policies of glasnost and perestroika. Glasnost, or openness, meant a greater willingness on the part of Soviet officials to allow Western ideas and goods into the USSR. Perestroika, was an initiative that allowed limited market incentives to Soviet citizens. Prior to this time, the USSR had strictly prohibited liberal reform and maintained an inefficient command economy in which the government controlled and regulated production, distribution, and prices. Gorbachev hoped these changes would be enough to spark the sluggish Soviet economy. Freedom, however, is addictive. Massive bad publicity worldwide came when Soviet fighters shot down a civilian airliner, Korean Air Flight 007, which carried 269 passengers and crew. Together with its low credibility explanation of the meltdown of the nuclear reactor at Chernobyl in 1986, 
The episode demonstrated an inability to deal with public relations crises. The Soviet propaganda system was only aimed at people who were already committed friends of the Soviet Union. The greater political and social freedoms sought by Gorbachev were created in an atmosphere of open criticism of the communist regime. Relaxation under Glasnost resulted in the Communist Party losing its absolute grip on the media. Before long, and much to the embarrassment of the authorities, the media began to expose severe social and economic problems that the Soviet government had long denied and actively concealed. The rise of nationalism under this new freedom of speech soon reawakened ethnic tensions in various Soviet republics, further discrediting the ideal of a unified Soviet people. On June 12, 1987, American President Ronald Reagan challenged Gorbachev to go further with his social and democratic reforms with a highly symbolic gesture. At a speech at the Brandenburg Gate, next to the Berlin Wall, Reagan stated, General Secretary Gorbachev, if you seek peace, if you seek prosperity for the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, if you seek liberalization, come here to this gate. Mr. Gorbachev, open this gate. Mr. Gorbachev, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. The unraveling of the Soviet bloc began in Poland in June of 1989. Grassroots organizations such as Poland's Solidarity Movement rapidly gained ground with strong popular bases. In February of 1989, the Polish government opened talks with the opposition, known as the Polish Roundtable Agreement, which allowed elections with participation of anti-communist parties in June of 1989. The world watched with anxious eyes, expecting Soviet tanks to roll into Poland, preventing the new government from taking power. Gorbachev, however, refused to act. Like dominoes, Eastern European communist dictatorships fell one by one. The initially inconspicuous opening of a border gate of the Iron Curtain between Austria and Hungary in August of 1989 triggered a chain reaction. Also in 1989, the communist government in Hungary started to negotiate organizing of competitive elections which took place in 1990. In Czechoslovakia and East Germany, mass protest unseated communist leaders. In November of 1989, East and West Germans were tearing down the Berlin Wall with pickaxes. The communist regimes in Bulgaria and Romania also crumbled, in the latter case as a result of a violent uprising. After the democratic revolutions of 1989 in Eastern Europe, the Warsaw Pact was formally declared non-existent on July 1, 1991, at a final summit meeting of Warsaw Pact leaders in Prague, Czechoslovakia. Deployed Soviet troops were gradually withdrawn from the former satellites, now politically independent countries. The decades-long confrontation between Eastern and Western Europe was formally rejected by members of the Warsaw Pact, all of which, with the exception of the Soviet successor state of Russia, subsequently joined NATO. These changes seem to establish a new relationship between the two superpowers. This new relationship was demonstrated by the joint American-Soviet opposition to Iraq's invasion of Kuwait. The Soviet Union voted in the United Nations Security Council 
to authorize the use of military force against its former Middle Eastern ally. Several existing conflicts in the third world nations such as Cambodia, Angola, and Nicaragua related to the Cold War would come to an end during this era of cooperation. With both the Soviet Union and the United States working together to pressure their respective proxies to make peace with one another. Overall, this detente, which accompanied the final twilight of the Cold War, would help bring about a relatively more peaceful world. Demands for freedom soon spread to the Soviet Union itself. The Soviet Union recognized the independence of the Baltic states of Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania on September 6, 1991. Talks of similar sentiments were heard in the Ukraine, the Caucasus region consisting of the countries of Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Georgia, and the Central Asian states of Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Turkmenistan, and Uzbekistan. Here, Gorbachev wished to draw the line. Self-determination for Eastern Europe was one thing, but he intended to maintain the territorial integrity of the Soviet Union. In 1991, he proposed a union treaty, giving greater autonomy to the Soviet republics while keeping them under central control. More open elections led to the election of candidates opposed to Communist Party rule. In August of 1991, a coup by conservative hardliners took place. Gorbachev was placed under house arrest. Meanwhile, Boris Yeltsin, the leader of the Russian Soviet Republic, demanded the arrest of the hardliners. The army and the public sided with Yeltsin and the coup failed. Nationalist leaders like Yeltsin were far more popular than the previous Soviet leadership, even with the softened policies put in place. Although restored to power, Gorbachev's authority had been irreparably undermined. In December of 1991, Ukraine, Belarus, and Russia itself declared their independence. On December 26, 1991, the USSR officially dissolved. Fifteen newly independent nations were born from its remains, including a Russia with a democratic elected anti-communist leader. The Cold War had come to an end. Unfortunately, the conflicts did not, some even continuing to today. Yugoslavia threw off the yoke of communism only to dissolve quickly into violent civil war. The Yugoslavs' wars were a series of separate but related ethnic conflicts, wars of independence, and insurgencies fought in the former Yugoslavia from 1991 to 2001, which led to the breakup of the Yugoslav Federation in 1992. Its constituent republics declared independence despite unresolved tensions between ethnic minorities and the new countries fueling the wars. In 1992, because of growing nationalist tensions within the new government, Czechoslovakia was peacefully dissolved by parliament. On January 1, 1993, it formally separated into two independent countries, the Czech Republic and Slovakia. Americans were pleasantly shocked, but shocked nonetheless, at the turn of events in the Soviet bloc. Both Republicans and Democrats were quick to claim credit for winning the Cold War. Others pointed out that no one really won the Cold War. The United States spent trillions of dollars arming themselves for a direct confrontation with the Soviet Union that fortunately never came. The Soviets spent an even larger percentage of their funds trying to keep up, a step that ultimately cost them a nation. Although many in the former Soviet Union realized additional freedoms, others faced regional, racial, and religious conflict. While the central government in the Russian Republic still remains strong, many in the country still seek additional freedom and an expanded political voice concepts 
that had brought about change in the former Soviet satellite states. However, most opposition organizations independent from the Kremlin encounter restrictive laws on new political parties and strict censorship in government-controlled major mass media outlets. Leading members of opposition groups have become targets of violence, including arrest, harassment, and even assassinations. Most Americans, on the other hand, found it difficult to get used to the idea of no Cold War. Since 1945, Americans were born into a world that featured anti-communist witch hunts, backyard bomb shelters, a space race, a missile crisis, detente, and the Star Wars defense proposal. Now the enemy was beaten, but the world remained unsafe. In many ways, facing one superpower was simpler than challenging dozens of rogue states and renegade groups sponsoring global terrorism, especially when the terrorist organizations can strike anywhere. So what has the world learned from the Cold War? Hopefully, we have realized the hopelessness of nuclear conflict. Both sides stepped to the brink and then hesitated. As George Santanyi wrote in his work, Life of Reason, in 1905, those that cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. State-sponsored terrorism and widespread nuclear proliferation are now among the world's greatest fears, so it does not appear that human conflict is a lesson that has been learned. In 1922, Santanyi wrote a passage in another of his works, entitled Soliloquies in England and Later Soliloquies. Here he penned the following, Yet the poor fellows think they are safe. They think that the war is over. Only the dead have seen the end of war. <laughs>